This call is being recorded. Okay, first of all, can I just do a quick screen check? Can you all see the screen that says ladies be architects? Yes, I can see that. Yes, I can. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, and obviously you can all hear me because you all answered me. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I want to um, welcome you all to today's first study group. Um, this is the first time that I've ever done anything like this. Um, so I'm always looking for feedback um, and always looking to find out what the sort of things I could, um, we can put together to help you guys study for your um, for, for any of any of the exams that you want to take um, within Salesforce. Um, before we start, it's really important that I just make it very clear. Um, this group is not run by Salesforce and uh, neither is it run by Blue Wolf. Um, Blue Wolf is my employer and Salesforce is obviously providing the platform that we all know and love. Um, so we are actually just running this as a success community group off our own back and just dedicating a bit of time to um, to help everybody in the community. So just to reiterate, this isn't being run by Salesforce, although they're happy for us to do it. So um, well, let me introduce myself. Those of you who I kind of know from Twitter and who I work with and who I've met face to face yeah. already um, are here. Um, but it, um, we've only ever really spoken on Twitter. We've only ever really spoken in, in text. So let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Gemma Emmett. I used to be Gemma Knight, as uh, Jessica told me. We used to work for the same company together, but in different countries. Um, I'm a 13 times certified um, Salesforce professional and I, I currently work for Blue Wolf which is an IBM company. Um, I'm now an application architect which I'm happy to have achieved before the end of the year. Unfortunately I didn't make system architect today. I had one exam scheduled today which I kind of failed miserably so I'm going to go away and study that one a bit harder. Um, I've got six super badges. I love meeting new people and I am I am actively working towards my certified technical architect credential, um, giving myself until the end of next year to complete it. Next year is my 10th year of working with Salesforce. So it's something I'm very um, keen to achieve oh, next year. Um, yeah. Those of you who aren't aware, I'm from Great Britain. Um, and I'm based, based in London, but I live about 50 miles north of it. Um, I do like to travel. My husband works in Salesforce as well. And um, because I'm working on a lot of these certifications, I would love to chat to you all on Twitter about and LinkedIn, if, if you prefer, about your individual journeys and how we can all help each other. So the other reason that this is that this has come together is um, due to a new group that we've started to put together. Now, this is nothing to do with compartmentalizing uh, females who want to work on this certified architecture path. In fact, if anything, it's there to encourage a an underrepresented area of the certified community. And there's a lot of um, mythology going around and superstitions about um, the certified technical architect um, credential um, saying that there's a lot of code that's needed and that you really do need to be a very very specialist person to complete that and well whilst that is in some ways true it is quite a, a difficult certification to achieve um, what Deborah and I at Salesforce have been trying to do with this group is to um, encourage people and, and and help them to understand they're not alone, that there are plenty of ladies out there who want to be, who want to work up to that level of certified technical architect. In fact, there are also plenty of males and females who maybe don't want to go all the way up the pyramid, but would like to complete some of the um, areas, some, some certifications in the areas that they specialize in, such as sharing or um, community and so on. Um, so really the purpose of the group is just to bring those people together and to support each other with some of the unique challenges that we have as an underrepresented group of um, people within this community. So today we're going to talk about territory management and this is particularly covered in depth within the sharing and visibility designer exam. Um, I quite liked that exam. It was an interesting one. Um, I say that 
you know, with massive nerd specs on, but I used to work as an admin when I first started. And because of that, it was very much um, something I had to deal with day in, day out was sharing and visibility. We had a very locked down sharing model. So I learned the hard way about this. Come on in. Um, so what I wanted to kind of do today is not, some of it is gonna be structured as a presentation, but I thought that we could watch a video together um, of somebody setting up territory management, that we could look at some of the resource guides, um, give an overview of some of the key points that we need that are covered in the certification exam. Um, so do feel free to make notes as and when you want to. Um, and what I've tried to do is actually pull together all the points that I found the most relevant um, for the certification exam within this um, very, very short, almost training course. Um, in terms of Q&A, please shout out at any time if you have anything that you want to ask, if you have any feedback, if there's something that you prefer to do a little bit differently. Um, you can either do that in this forum or if you feel more comfortable, um, please reach out to me afterwards if that's something you would prefer. Um, today's agenda, just going to go through territory management and some of the concepts. Um, I know there are people, some, some of my colleagues have joined us because uh, we were talking about territory management as solution architects and trying to understand how we would know whether to deploy it or not in a customer's org. So we're going to cover a little bit of that decision guide um, and help you understand whether your customer actually does need territory management because of their requirements. And certainly if you're an administrator as well and you're thinking about territory management, then it's an, inter then it's an interesting guide to use. We'll talk about how to deploy territory management. We'll watch um, a video of a lovely gentleman who seems to be shy and doesn't talk about it, but definitely takes us through the right steps to set up territory management. So I thought that if maybe I can have a little go at talking you through it. Um, then we'll talk about territory account assignment rules, and then we'll look at some next steps for study. Um, so how to prepare yourself for the exam, some great resources, and then we can just, we'll just have it as an open forum. Okay, so territory management. Um, we often hear it spoken about in the context of managing ownership. So you quite often come, come up against a scenario where the customer is saying, well, I've got an account here and it's actually owned by two people, or I want to be able to, I don't want to be able to, to I don't want to have to do a big data load at the end of each year to transfer 10,000 accounts around between territories. It's just, it takes ages and people are working overtime and all of that. So the, what used to happen was um, it, back in the old days, we, um, Salesforce had the old version of territory management, but that wasn't so robust in terms of sharing. So Salesforce went back to the drawing board a couple of years ago and released enterprise territory management, which is much newer, but is also much more robust because it, it helps to manage the sharing of data as well as managing um, your territory model. So territory management in Salesforce applies only to accounts, but you can enable some opportunity territory management as well. Um, because obviously the last thing you want to do is transfer 20,000 accounts and all the salespeople who were dealing with great big multi-million pound deals all kicking off because they've suddenly lost their opportunity to someone else and they're not going to get the commission for it. Nightmare, right? So there is a way of ensuring that if you want to reassign opportunities that are open, so for example, you've got renewals that you need to assign when you change your territories at the end of the year, then you can do that, but you need to write an Apex class and tell Salesforce to look at that Apex class. They do give you one out of the box. You just need someone who's a bit clever to go through and um, update it. Unless, of course, that person is yourself. <laughs> now, with territory management, it is something that has to, you have to have forecasting enabled and it has to be customizable forecasting. It can't be enabled if you've got collaborative forecasting. It just goes, <laughs> doesn't work. But you can actually enable it but yourself without having to contact Salesforce once it's been set up. This is enterprise territory management. So why do we do it? Well, being able to assign your accounts to different territories means that you can more effectively level out the coverage of your account by your sales in accordance with your sales strategy. So you're then reducing your costs of selling them because you're able to allocate Say if you're in, in, for example, in the USA, you've got quite a, la a large landmass to cover. 
So if you're able to then apportion your opportunities to certain zip code areas and states and counties, then you will reduce your selling costs because your salespeople aren't having to fly everywhere. Um, you can improve your customer service. People who are more local um, to their customers, for example, might be able to um, add, a, add a more uh, friendly edge certainly from a strategic perspective as well, where you've got some of your most experienced sales reps, you can allocate those to some of your more strategic accounts to ensure that they're getting that, all the touch points that they need. And if you wanted to manage, well, obviously everybody does, but man managing and measuring how your sales teams are performing is, 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 is made easier by territory management. You will get asked these in the exam. They, they do like to give you a scenario um, and ask you what would be the best solution and what would be the best structure for a territory. So it's a good idea to kind of play with this in your own trailhead org. So why Salesforce territory management? Why not just do this all in a spreadsheet and then update and create custom objects and have accounts, you know, related to these custom objects? You know, it's easy, right? Doesn't mean that you have, doesn't mean that you should do it that way. So you can use territory management to set up some criteria and say, right, all of the um, all of the accounts where uh, city equals London, please allocate to and customer type equals strategic, please allocate to this cut to this territory, strategic London customers, for example. Your territory hierarchy is is completely independent of your role hierarchy, so you can still enforce the private sharing model within your Salesforce org but then have it respect the territories that, um, that, it, that your accounts belong to. Another perfect benefit of using it in Salesforce is that you can move your accounts very easily from one territory to another, and you can have multiple users assigned to a single territory, as well as multiple, uh, one account being assigned to multiple territories as well. So as I mentioned before, enterprise territory management is a newer version of territory management in Salesforce. And there are a few key concepts to familiarize yourself with. So territories are known as, um, they're, in, they're effectively, when you open up a territory, it looks just like any other record in Salesforce, but it's a way of organizing groups of accounts and the users that need to work with them. They're based on territory types. And those, though, these territory types are the ones that need to be defined as you sit down at the end of the year, um, planning for next year. So if you've got, if you're a sales manager and you have lots of different um, strategic areas that you plan to target for the following year, then a ter you would generally set up your territory types in accordance with those strategic areas. For example, named accounts or um, London or um, telesales accounts. For I'm just going back to my roots there. Um, so a territory type example. So your organization, this is unfortunately lifted and shifted from the book, but it made the, per made the most sense to me. Um, so one of the things that you can do with ter territory types when you set them up is actually prioritize them as well. So you can say, my named accounts are a higher priority account than say my mid-market accounts. And that means that when you, were, if you were then to change your account territory type, so let's say you had a custom field called territory or, you know, let's say one of your accounts goes from being a mid-market account to being a strategic account because you've just set up a partnership with them and they're going to do lots of things for you. Then you could change the type of that account to named account and then that would assign priority, that, that account to priority one, which is your named accounts type, territory type. When you define your territories, uh, your territory type, that's when you give it a priority and it helps those creating territories make the right type choice. So as another example, at mid-year, you think you're going to have some extra growth opportunity in the Great Lakes region. So you create a new territory type called Great Lakes and assign it priority three to reflect the change in your strategy. So if you're a consultant, and you're looking at territory management, one of the things, or a solution architect looking at territory management with a client, one of the things that you would have to do is, is get a real, under, a solid understanding of what their sales strategy plans to be, is planned to be for this year and next year, so that you can help them build out the correct hierarchy. Now, in terms of these hierarchies, they're not static. You can build up to four territory models in Salesforce. 
So it means that you can actually play with different strategies and perhaps present them to your sales directors and have them approve it before you put it live. Only one of your territory models can be active at one time. It's a way of organizing all of your different territories into a hierarchical structure so that you can preview it um, and so that you can test it effectively. Effect, your territory model is basically an entire system um, for your company. So even if your sales directors can't decide whether they're going to go for uh, the utilities sector next year or and within that sector, are they going to, um, I don't know, target those organizations with 50, 500 plus employees? If they're not sure about that, then you can actually build that model out with them in a workshop, show it to them, go through it with them and, and then get some um, decisions on the fly. Well, you could even configure some of it on the fly, show it to them, test it and then get them to approve it. So your territory model is basically where you're going to um, organize your hierarchy. So the screenshot there shows it shows a hierarchy that's been put together as an example. So you've got California North, California North coast cities and then inland. And then you've got all of the other different um, territories that have been set up there as well. So those of us who are used to working with role hierarchies, this won't look too strange to us. So within the territory model, you can create and edit and delete territories. You can run assignment rules for your accounts and you can activate and archive the model itself. You might get asked a question about that as well. Um, as I seem to recall, it was saying it was asking about territory models and where you would put those um, set those territories up. So it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with those menu options. Um, there are three states of territory models. So planning is means that you're previewing it before you deploy it. And that's where you do most of your build. Active, it's up and running and done. You can't change it once it's active, um, but you can revert it back to planning status to make changes. Obviously, as with anything, make sure you do it in a sandbox first. Um, if it's archived, then your users, it's effectively an old territory model. So you might want to keep that for historic purposes, um, perhaps um, archive it, give it a name and explain, and maybe even just to add it some extra value, put in the description um, some key performance indicators that were met and target, you know, think lessons learned, things that went well, things that didn't go so well under that territory model so that you can play it back to people in the future. Once you've archived that territory model state, um, sorry, once you've archived that territory model, it's not something that can be reactivated. So you have to be quite careful about when you archive it. So you need a good plan for putting the new territory model live and retiring the old one. The good news is you can clone territory models as well. So if nothing much changes, but there are still some changes, then you'll find that an easier, quicker and easier way to do it. So the permissions that you need, obviously, if you're a system administrator, you're going to have managed territories ticked already for you. So you're going to be able to create those models and related territories and types. You'll be able to run your rules. And then for your users, if they if you want them to be able to see what the current territory model is and view the account records that are assigned to individual territories, then you, they need to have view set up and configuration. I believe many, many places have this set up anyway. Um, Okay, so how does that, how does territory management affect forecasting? So whenever you enable territory management, your territory hierarchy effectively becomes the forecast hierarchy. So that does mean that you need to go and assign a forecast manager to each territory, uh, parent territory, to make sure that all of the forecast data is summarized up from the opportunities. Users will have a different forecast for each territory. So if I look after California and Arizona, I'll have different forecasts for each of those. OK. When you set up a territory, you get asked the usual things um, such as name and description, but you'll have to also put in the level of account access that you give to users assigned in that territory. And we'll have a little look at that in a moment when we watch the video. Um, you also define what level of access you want to give to cases. Um, you, can, you have a checkbox on there that gives you the option to confine your opportunity assignments. So that stops you dishing out other people's opportunities when you run the assignment rules and having lots and lots of salespeople coming over to your desk and setting it on fire because they're so angry. 
Um, then your territory fields, um, to continue with that, you have a forecast manager defined on the territory as well. You have the contact access rules, the parent territory for your hierarchy, how you're sharing it and how you're sharing opportunities as well. So as I mentioned earlier, just a really quick recap to switch this on, you've got to have customizable forecasting switched on. Um, obviously, please do it in the sandbox first. Um, otherwise, I will be crying for you. Um, it would be um, difficult to obviously once you've put that live, it's going to be fairly difficult to um, undo any damage that's done to your data by assigning um, territories. So always, always, if you can do it in a full copy sandbox. Um, it's also a good opportunity to re-examine your role hierarchy. So if you make sure your role hierarchy makes sense, that it's it's sharing data how it as, as it should and it's structured correctly, then you can actually optionally use that to produce your first territory hierarchy, which I think is quite handy. Um, however, it doesn't always work the same way. You, you know, your sales, this is why it's really important to structure your territories in accordance with your strategy, as opposed to in accordance with your organization structure but of course usually when territories are readjusted the organization structure will also change so you you can have those discussions to see if um if you think a reorg is appropriate on both sides so the steps to build the model so first you create the model create your territory types create your territories define your roles add your users and run your rules shall we have a little look at the video So this is a YouTube video. It is on silent at the moment because basically the guy hasn't put any, um, there's a gentleman called Paul Lathrop. He's very kindly posted this up on YouTube. Um, he hasn't put any commentary or narrative around it. It's just some nice music. So it's very relaxing. Um, by all means, please take it in after the call. Um, but I'll try and talk you through what he's doing as he's doing it on the screen. So hopefully you can all see this now. So he's gone in and he's, create, he's enabled territory management. So he's going to go into territory models. And he is doing this in classic because um, at the moment that's where it's working more robustly. So he's created a model called testing model. And he's going to show you what's going on in there. So he's just got his current state is in planning. It's going to give it a description. But you might want to put in there, if it's your own example, you could say this is for 2017-18. So now he's going to go and set up his types. So he's got a type called test. But an example you could put in here could be something like named accounts. And then you put your priority in. So he's saying this is priority one. So now he's going into the model and he's going to start adding all his territories by viewing the hierarchy. So there's his test model. It's in planning stage at the moment. So he's going to go and create some territories. So obviously your label, California, and its API name. And then he's going to select the territory type that he set up earlier. So this could be California strategic accounts, for example. And then it has a parent and a little description. And then he can decide whether he wants to give users access to view and edit accounts or whether they can view, edit, transfer and delete accounts. Okay. So the next thing he has to do is go and add users to this territory. So you can see he could add two people to that territory if they work together on the same accounts. Yep, yeah, so he's happy with that. And the next thing to do is to create an account assignment rule. And this is where you can do it based on criteria. So you can, he's gonna build a rule here that looks for California. So I assume it's going to be state equals DA. So he's doing it off billings, billing state. So there'll be some discussions with your um, salespeople to decide 
which state they go by, whether it's shipping or billing. Then if you've got any other territories underneath California, you can choose to apply that rule to those to those children underneath it. Okay, cool. So he's done that now. Now at this stage, though, when he looks at the territory, he will not see any accounts in there because he's not run the rule yet. So he's going back into his model. And for some reason he's editing it. Okay, have a look at the hierarchy. And then he's activating it. Now I've made the mistake of running the rules before activating it. And then I was most perturbed when I discovered that I had still had no accounts in there. Oh, God, what have I done? So I did go back and rerun it. Sorry, activate it, then rerun it. <laughs> so please run your assignment rules. There we go. And now what that's doing is it's changing the territory for all of the accounts where the billing state is California and it's allocating those into the California territory. So let's have a look and see if it's worked. He's gonna create a new list view to identify it. And he's saying, show me all my territory's accounts. Obviously he is assigned to that territory. And there are all his accounts. Okay. So that was quite an interesting video. So that so if you wanted to go away and do that yourself, it helps to um, it helped me certainly for the examination to kind of go through and build all that out myself um, alongside reading the um, implementation guides because they give you whilst they can be a little wordy, if you can refer to that and you've got some um, some um, actual exercises to do, then that always helps. Um, the next piece is around decision uh, the decision guide itself. So um, what I've done here is I've opened up a link to um, the territory management decision guide, and this will show you how you can, wh what are the most appropriate times and scenarios in which to suggest territory management. So let me just get... Um, ah, there we go. Let me just get the um, browser open. And this is this is where this this decision guide is actually a fantastic document that will help you um, on its own. So it's not lurking around inside another guide, but they've they've put a lot of explanation in here about when is the best time to do it. Um, so if so, effectively, if you've got um, so if you're going to forecast in Salesforce then uh, territory management's a fantastic, uh, you know, that takes you on the, on the right path. Um, then the next one is, does customizable forecasting meet your business requirements? So if, it's, if it doesn't and you haven't got sufficient benefits for territory management, then, you're not, then it's not a great idea. But if you, if you are going to use customizable forecasting and you've got people submitting forecasts to multiple managers, then territory management will be a good way to go because of the fact that you could be responsible for multiple territories who each have their own managers. Um, in, terms of, in terms of if you're not forecasting in Salesforce, but you have a single source of truth outside of Salesforce and you need to be able to represent data in different territories, then that might be um, a good idea to go, to go with. So as a consultant, this diagram helps me to understand, this diagram helps me to understand as a consultant which questions I need to ask. And um, they help me to understand the answers to those questions and then be able to recommend the appropriate solution in my spec. So that's definitely something that you don't you won't be asked any questions upon that um, in detail, but you would be um, presented with a question that says, 
universal containers has this kind of uh, requirements um, what would be the best way to manage it um, this person needs to see this and that person needs to see the other and territory management may be an option in there that you can that you can look for so it's a good idea to at least understand this in some level uh, apologies if that's a little vague it was a little while ago okay so so we've talked about um, territory assi account assignment rules. So that's what we saw the gentleman do on the video uh, not long ago. So it was a bit, it was his way of moving those accounts and their associated opportunities and cases as an option um, into a territory. There are two types of assignments. So um, and this is just something to watch out for because if you have um, if you if, sorry, I was just checking, make sure everyone could hear me. Um, so if you have um, territories that have parent territories and you are wondering why an account is sitting in a different territory than it should be, then it's worth checking um, to see if your account's been impacted by an inherited assignment. So if you had an account moved because the rules were higher, um, higher up than the territory it belongs to, um, your accounts could end up moving, but you can actually run them. You can actually make manual adjustments to any territory. So if somebody's account gets moved by accident, you can actually decide to move it further, um, move it to a different territory manually or move it back manually. So some great resources, um, some must reads. The exam resource guide um, is absolutely brilliant. And I think that I passed this exam because I went through the resource guide with a fine tooth comb. Um, so you'll find that on the um, you'll find that on the architect pay on the architects um, exam page. Um, if so if you go to two seconds, there we go. Um, so it's this guide here. And what Salesforce has done, rather than put it all into the ebooks, it's moved um, a number of really good resources into the into these guides. And one thing you'll find in here is there's quite a mixture of different learning styles in here. So you're given um, trailheads, you're given videos. There are some Dreamforce sessions in there as well that I've been using to study with. And certainly from the territory management side of things, you get um, you get several resources to help you with the with understanding the trade-offs between territory management and other things uh deployments the decision guide i've mentioned earlier any best practices there's a good knowledge article there and then there are some um there, there is the actual implementation guide so i found just working through that implementation guide making notes writing them all down in my book and then actually practicing them um really help the knowledge go in so it put me in a good position for the um, for, for the uh, exam itself. Um, the video we watched earlier is the cute video that's shown here. Um, so I'll give a send, I'll send out this. Sorry, I will post this into the Ladies Be Architects group so that you can all um, get to the uh, get to these resources yourself later on. So next steps, I can recommend two trailheads that are really really good. Um, exercises to complete and they're quite new so one of them is the sales territory planning from the salesperson's perspective and the other one is about sales territories and forecasting in Salesforce um, and it's a really because obviously if you've got a new a new trailhead playground in there you could these are just these are just a springboard you could um, I mean one of the things that I did was I did these badges spun up a new trailhead org and then went through the enterprise territory management guide worked through each step by step loaded i even loaded some data there's a really good site called data generator and you can put in any fields that you want and it will just spurt out a csv file and you can just push that into salesforce and play with it that way so that's a good option and obviously the more practice that you get just playing with it um the more knowledge you will the more knowledge you'll have um and i've actually found it's made me a better architect because having studied it and having a good understanding of it means I can listen to what my customers are saying to me and I can make that evaluation and judgment in my mind um, and then decide whether or not to mention it. <laughs> so I was going to say thank you to everybody for coming along. I'm going to open up for questions in just a moment. But before I do, um, I would love it if you would come and join our Trailblazer community group. Um, it's called Ladies Be Architects. Couldn't call it anything more slang than that. 
Um, but if you do come and join us, um, please don't be shy. Ask us some questions. Talk to us. Tell us about your experiences. Tell us if you're doing an exam that day so that we can all cheer you on. And um, please don't forget to fill out your personal profile. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, there is a PowerPoint template in there that you can complete. Just takes a minute or so to do. Um, so we can all get to know each other a bit better. Um, I'll arrange, um, I'll see if I can arrange for an informal meetup at the London World Tour. And then we can talk to Deborah about um, another Dreamforce meeting next year. Um, so I understand that this year's one was really successful. Um, if you're not a fan, if you'd rather tweet, then please tweet us, um, use the hashtag and tell us how you're doing with your exams. The other uh, thing I wanted to ask as well is if anybody would like to volunteer to run a study group, um, then we would absolutely love, um, love to have you come and run it for us. Um, we can put up a vote and see which topic um, people want to study next. And if, and as always, you know, we, we, this is only the first session and we would like to make it better for everybody. Um, so please don't be shy. Give us some feedback. Give us some constructive feedback. Give us some good feedback. Give us some ideas of how we can improve these sessions and make them more interactive. So I'm very conscious I've just been the <laughs> to everybody. Um, and don't be shy. You know, it is Christmas. Feedback's a gift. So we would be more than happy to hear from you. So I'm going to open up for questions. Thank you very much for everybody to everybody for listening. I have a question. Um, when you move an a uh, model to archive, what do you do? Do you have to move the assigned accounts before you can archive the model? I don't know the answer to that one. I believe you would have to. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it would, you would need to give them all new, new territories, but I can take that question away and then um, get back to you on the forum. Okay. Thanks. That was my only Thank question. You. No, it's a really good one. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone else like to ask a question, give us some feedback? Okay, lovely. Oh, I'll let everybody um, grab 10 minutes back then of their day. Um, thank you so much for coming along to the session. Um, please send me, send me a message if you'd like, if you prefer to give feedback privately. Um, but I'm very keen to hear your inputs. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you.